I'm absolutely privileged and delighted to be here today uh, to introduce uh, Professor Kurt Barnhard, who's going to talk to us about recurrent implantation and recurrent miscarriage today. Um, and I just want to ask you the first question is maybe you can tell us where we are and what we're doing at the moment um, because we're, it's quite an exciting time. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much. This is lovely to be the Aspire meeting, my, my first time in this area of the world. Thrilled to be here. Um, so you asked a, a very important question. Um, recurrent implantation failure and recurrent pregnancy loss are uh, very different in their, um, how should we say, this evolution of what the disease and process is and what we should do about it. We've been struggling with reproductive pregnancy loss for a long time, um, while we might debate the definition of whether it's two or three losses or whether it's a clinical loss or a biochemical loss. We've dealt with this problem for a long time and understand it. It's a recognized pregnancy um, and then we have to decide how many losses are abnormal and then decide what to do about it. Re recurrent implantation failure is novel um, and there are many that believe it's really um, an entity that we're trying to characterize as disease that isn't necessarily a disease. Uh, some of the background is that, well, if, if people are supposed to get pregnant with IVF and if they're not, there must be something wrong, and let's use the same characterization of number of losses, so to speak, and therefore we can characterize a clinical entity. Where I'm not sure that that characterization is true, um, and what you do about it is still very, very different. So let's decide which one we want to talk about, but um, although they have similar names, I don't believe that they're the same entity. Fantastic. So in terms of the numbers, uh, the thing that amazes me is we've m made a clinical entity on numbers, not etiology. Right. Can you talk a little bit about maybe why that's happened, but also how we could get back to actually getting a, a, a diagnosis, whether you have one or two or three or four, <laughs> and, and how do you go about working through that process? I think, I think they're going to end up to be mirror images of each other. When we were studying re re recurrent pregnancy loss, all we could do was count. At the very beginning, years ago, decades ago, we knew someone had a positive pregnancy test and resulted in a, in a terrible miscarriage. And so we had to just kind of define that. Well, let's talk about the parameters. Is it you know before 20 weeks? Is it is it early? And then we got into these debates I mentioned about how many and, and when it is. But we, we, we had an understanding of that. Um, in terms of numbers and in etiology. Now, look how far we've come. Now we can decide that a miscarriage is very likely due to uterine anomaly, or a miscarriage is more likely due to the genetics of the embryo. And I think that's where the most astonishing research is going, to where um, it's just not uh, any point of an embryo. There's, there's a, an entire basis of literature that's going to change the way we practice in years, where we're studying something called the intolerance or basic um, subsets of the, the, the genome that might be associated with miscarriage and aren't just the number of chromosomes. And I think the latest, the latest um, etiologies are, are believing that it's still genetic, although it's not just a major genetic anomaly. Um, so I think we can start characterizing pregnancy loss very easily by whether you have a normal embryo or a not normal embryo, and that changes things dramatically in terms of etiology. Or, I put it another way, um, whether your etiology is expected to work or not, right? So, I mean, giving someone aspirin is not going to save a pregnancy that is genetically abnormal. Um, and, and, and I think a lot of our issues have been, we've been doing big randomized controlled trials in groups of people with large numbers of pregnancy losses, but there's probably a lot of different etiologies where a drug may work or a treatment may work for one but not the other, but we've not been good at diagnosing them. Um, so maybe, uh, would you be able to talk a little bit about the advancement in uh, testing and some of the things that are making those changes? Sure. Um, I think, let me talk about the, the therapy first. I mean, there's been great work, as, as those large randomized trials you mentioned, incredible amounts of work to put into them and incredible sacrifices of women to be in the trial and large amounts of work. They've been mildly disappointing in that they haven't found the golden bullet or the silver bullet, I guess it is. Um, but it's for the reasons that you say, that the, you have to enroll so many people to have some of them have non-chromosomal abnormal miscarriages to show that there's a treatment effect in that group, which then is 
diluted by the non-treatment effect in other groups. So I don't want to minimize the work that went on in the trials assessing aspirin or progesterone and things like that. Um, if we could test them, we could then therefore have um, a smaller trial. But the, the problem is the testing happens after the failure of treatments, um, not before. So until we can have something like a very early non-invasive test, that's as soon as someone's pregnant, we know if it's genetically normal or not, we're still going to be stuck with, we have to treat everybody and find out what happened later. Um, and when you are working with untested embryos, mm -hmm. it, it, you have to put a lot back for certain age groups. Age really becomes a factor there. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, now we're shifting a little bit into the recurrent pregnancy, I'm sorry, the recurring implantation failure. So, um, let me just start with the, the definition that people have proposed is that three euploid embryo transfers resulting in no pregnancy, uh, interestingly not by birth, but no pregnancy is something that people have tried to call recurrent implantation failure. The problem is then people are extrapolating that from, well, I had a normal embryo by morphology, but it wasn't tested genetically, so you really don't know if it's genetically normal, um, and we and others have decided that there, you can at least mathematically take a table and say the expected normal embryo by age can tell you how many embryos you need to transfer. So in a young woman, less than 35, perhaps that number is close to three or four, but in many of my patients are 38 and 41 and 42. Um, and then the expected aneuploidy rate in those women is very high, so you might need to transfer nine or ten embryos before you can have a, an assumption that three were normal. Um, but many people are not making that mathematical calculation, and they're saying a 40-year-old that has three good-looking embryos under the microscope, something must be wrong. When I would argue something must be wrong is that they have an aneuploid embryo that was transferred. Right. And so where do you, in, in terms of genetic testing, uh, we've got some, some good techniques. Um, there's certainly a lot of development in that area. Do you want to make a comment on the accuracy of genetic testing and how things are changing in the field right now? That's the hottest topic in the field is in genetic testing. And um, I would argue that every time there's an advancement, it makes me wonder how accurate the previous testing was. <laughs> um, there really is an evolution. Um, so right now, I think the testing for aneuploidy is relatively good. If you have, a, if you have a, a, a test that comes back euploid or aneuploid for an entire chromosome, that result is fairly accurate. I don't and, want to say 100%, but pretty and, accurate. And that's using sequencing or CGH arrays or what? Um, Correct. It's, it's usually using um, new generation, next generation sequencing, and then that's often supplemented with arrays on top of that to, to, um, to help identify the chromosomes. Where we get very, um, it gets very complex, and I know there's lectures on this even here at this symposium, where you start talking about um, segmental defects and, uh, and mosaic segmental defects, uh, and then it gets very hard to interpret. Um, as you know, there's been a shift in our field over the past 10 years where we, we are starting to use embryos that have these segmental defects or even entire chromosome um, mosaics and finding out that many of them result in pregnancies. Uh, and it seems obvious to say this, but I will. I mean, we don't really know if you get an aneuploid um, result and you get a normal child whether the test was wrong or the embryo actually was able to, to fix the defect. It's very interesting, isn't it? Um, in terms of, there's some work in carrier mapping to um, actually carrier type the embryos now, where you would take a blood test from the mother and the father and then look at where those chromosomes came from. What's your view on sort of the uptake of those kind of tests and will that help us with some of the segmental mosaics? Um, I think that's, that, that, again, an advancement that we're going to see. If we can really identify um, you know, which chromosome came from which parent and, and which one are you measuring, that will help the accuracy of the test. But remember, genetics is not that simple. Sometimes you get crossover, sometimes you, you get you know, take up different chromosomes, so it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, I don't see it helping as of today, but you know, hopefully it will in the future. 
Um, now, I'm going to get back to the other half of the equation, or maybe not half, which is more about the endometrium. When you're putting normal embryos back and you're either getting ongoing miscarriages or implantation failure, what do you do then? Well, even if, even if you agree that there's, um, you've transferred normal embryos and you, you're not just on the outlying aspects of a statistical bell-shaped curve, um, we start blaming the endometrium. The problem is we don't have a lot of really outstanding tests for what is correct endometrium or endometrial receptivity. I think we all agree that what sounded plausible as an endometrial receptivity test really hasn't helped us. That doesn't mean there isn't something in endometrium that isn't modifiable, just we haven't yet found it. Um, but uh, what, what I disagree with, even though you didn't ask me this question, is that we start adding on everything we can think of because that must, the problem must be the endometrium and therefore we must fix it. We scratch it, we inject it, we you know, put HCG, and all of these things are untested and unproven. And it's just because we feel we have to do something. I think the limiting factor is we just don't know what to do yet. Um, do you think in terms of research dollar, we should be looking at getting better tests so that we're actually using a, a logical framework of how we use our treatments and thoughts in terms of um, implantation and miscarriage? And yes. if we could get better tests, which have chronically been underfunded in women's health, um, that might help particularly in recurrent miscarriage. I, I agree. I, think it, I don't think we understand implantation very well. We're very rudimentary at this point. We all say the problem is a placentation problem, but we don't really know what that is. Is that the number of trophoblasts? Is that an invasion of the trophoblasts? Is that the immune response to the trophoblast invasion? Are all of these things modifiable? I have a colleague who has what they call a placenta on a chip and is testing many aspects of what can affect the, the depth and quality of trophoblast invasion. Um, and I think immunological aspects are going to be part of it. Um, I hate to say this, but natural killer cells keep coming back again and again. Um, I think if we can understand that molecular aspect, then we might have a better test and a better, better implementation. But we don't at the moment, so we, we, we have macro structures. We measure its thickness and its pattern, um, and I think those are just, to use that word again, very high-level structures. They're not very precise. Eventually, we're going to get to have a much more precise test. Now, what about our patients? What can they do for themselves? You know, how much is their metabolism or their lifestyle or things that they can actually modify themselves? And many are desperately trying to do that. How much does that play a role? Again, we don't have definitive answers here, yes or no, that one specific etiology or intervention will help. But I always encourage, you know, good lifestyle and, 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 and good health are always associated with better outcomes. I can't always identify the specifics of it, but, you know, um, what, you know, your, your, your exercise matters, your BMI matters, your, your health matters. Um, I know I don't mean to be negative here, but the fallacy is you've had a lifestyle for 30 years of your life, changing it for two months before you get pregnant sometimes doesn't change the underlying problem. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take control of your health. Of course you should. You should have a healthy lifestyle, a healthy weight, and healthy diet. But I, I don't know that a specific supplement or a specific diet is better than another. Um, what would you tell people in the Asia Pacific when you meet a couple and they have had, often they've had a, a delay to conception, but then miscarriages? How would you approach that? What, what are the kind of clinical pragmatic ways that in the clinic you would go, okay, we do this, we, we think about this, we, we think about that, and how do you convey that? Well, we should always test what we know, um, and I can all people that have this unfortunate problem of their late conception or miscarriage should get, get the standard workup that we know of now, that, that many um, societies have put together, estuary and ASRM. Um, we should definitely look at the anatomy and uh, associate it. We should definitely look at the hormonal milieu. Um, many times the hormonal milieu is telling us that there might be something wrong with the egg quality, not the endometrium, but it's still worth testing that. Um, we should still make sure that uh, you know people are not diabetic and even though there's quite a bit of controversy, we make sure the thyroid is, is normal. I mean, we should know what we know how to do. 
I'm surprised that many that these tests that seem mundane are just not performed. Um, and people are jumping to the, the novel tests when the novel test is not necessarily the one that might give you the answer you're looking for. So we need to work on that medical piece as well. So, <laughs> um, so we need to and, and consult our physicians and our, right. uh, you know, uh, some, sometimes do you find that people have some underlying condition you had no idea about, like CMV or yeah. uh, hepatitis or something that you just didn't understand that's part of the picture? Yeah, I mean, you should always look look for the obvious. You should always look for, for other things. And, and the big picture, just don't focus on the endometrium itself. Focus on the patient and, and understand if there are other reasons that health might not be optimal. Um, and sometimes we get so specialized in our thinking and our treatment um, that we focus on more organ that we lose the sight of the big picture for, for a woman or a couple. Um, because. Uh, you haven't asked me, but I'll mention it. You know, does, does the partner affect it? And the answer is yes, of course. But I'm not exactly sure the specificity of what I can do to, to fix that. Um, but the health of both partners is certainly going to affect the chance of getting pregnant and the health of both partners. And I guess the health of both partners is really important for parenting and grandparenting as well. Yeah, so, I you know, so. you may pick up things that you help them need a long line. So, yeah. well <laughs> anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure, as it always is. Thank you so much. Um, we're actually recording from a spa in Manila today, um, and hopefully that's given us a great insight into some of the things we can do for our patients in these very tricky situations. And so thank you very much. My pleasure. This is, a, this is a tricky situation, and I hope that someone other than me will be talking about this in five years and have even more specificity of the tests we can do and the advancement in the field. This is terrific. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.